Okay, hello. Uh, we are gonna get started. Aloha, everyone. My name is Jacob Aki. Uh, I am the director of communications for the Hawaii State Senate, and we just wanted uh, to thank each and every one of you uh, for joining our Senate District Two Town Hall. Um, and this town hall event uh, is being hosted by your senator from Senate District Two, uh, Senator Joyce San Buena Ventura. Um, before we get started with tonight's meeting, uh, we just wanted to go over some of the um, Zoom rules. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, have been on these Zoom calls before, um, but we just wanted to go over some of our rules. Um, we will be having a question and answer period. Um, if you do have a question, uh, we're going to ask that you raise your virtual hand. Um, so you are able to do that um, on the sidebar. Um, and if you are unable to, or you're joining us via telephone, um, then you can just speak up. But uh, we're gonna try to get through as many questions as you can um, and raising your virtual hand helps us to uh, keep track of who has a question. Um, and we're gonna also be asking that we, um, that we be on mute uh, so that uh, we don't get any of the feedback, but if you are speaking, then just um, remember to unmute yourself. Um, but we're going to get started. Uh, so I'm going to hand the floor over now to Senator Joyce San Buenaventura. Senator, the floor is yours. And I think you got to unmute, Senator. Sorry. So, sorry, thank you. And aloha, thank you so much for joining me on my first virtual town hall for as a senator. Um, the last broadband, I mean, the last town hall I had was over at the HPP Community Center, and that was February 2020, um, right before COVID-19 really hit on March when the legislative session was called to an halt, but I mean, virtually like only two to three weeks earlier. And it was a timely town hall because it was um, on broadband and telehealth. And that, that kind of reminded me of my 2018 town hall um, in January, 2018, which was like four months before the Kilauea lava flow of 2018 in May, and that was based on disaster preparedness. Um, so I am hoping not that another disaster doesn't occur after this town hall. So we're just gonna do an overview of what has happened um, since my last town hall. Um, first slide. I, I think my office manager is gonna be sharing his um, screen. Um, I am in the State Senate District 2. And John, can you show your first slide? Um, okay. So basically, I am chair of human services, same as at, at this, when I was in the House. But this time, I'm in the Senate Committees on Consumer Protection and Health. Um, next slide. I am. Um, Next slide, John. I'm also in the Keiki Caucus, Kapuna Caucus, Hawaiian Caucus, Women's Legislative Caucus, Progressive Caucus, Hawaii Island Caucus, and Filipino Caucus. So hopefully, I'm hoping to be able to hear all the issues around on uh, the, the various problems there are around the state so I can continue and serve the state of Hawaii. Next slide. Um, just an introductory note, as Jacob says, this is being streamed live on Facebook. And we will take questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, there will be a chat section and we will, um, otherwise we're gonna do a PowerPoint. Next slide. Um, basically, this is what we're gonna go through today. Next slide. So first thing, COVID-19 updates, as always, 27,000. 358 cases, a tenth of which is on, less than a tenth of it is on Hawaii Island, which means we're doing really well considering we have more than a tenth of the population base and we only have, and we have less than a tenth of the cases. 
And in fact, today we only have three active cases out of, I believe, um, 35 for the state. Again, 10% or more than 10% of the population. So good job, folks, that we're doing this very well. Um, next slide. Okay, so hardest hit areas are Hilo with 626 um, cases so far. Um, Kailua Kona's next, Keao, which is in our district, and Pahoa. So um, be careful. Even though we're doing very well, these are where um, we are seeing. And frankly, I keep hearing people grumble to me about the gatherings over in Kehana. But so far, as far as I've been hearing, there haven't been any clusters. But um, be careful out there. Next slide. Okay, so statewide, we're doing the best in the country with 19,322 cases. Okay, um, next one after us is um, Iowa, Utah, Oregon, and Washington, but we're doing very well. Next slide. Okay, vaccinations. We are currently in phase 1B, as you can tell in today's Star Advertiser um, headlines. We're hopefully going to start vaccinating those who are ages 70 and older. Next slide. But right now, phase 1B means, next slide, please, means um, 75 plus or over, um, 70, age 70 is to begin um, around March 15 and 65 to begin a couple weeks later. And this is later than expected originally because of the weather um, that delayed a lot of vaccines over in the mainland. But hopefully with the advent of the J and Johnson and Johnson vaccine, we can possibly expedite this. Um, so, and so, 1B is not only those who are 75 and older, it's also frontline workers. And that means um, grocery store workers, postal workers, all essential workers, and healthcare workers. Next slide. And including also teachers. Okay, so, so far we've been doing very well with about um, 38,530 doses administered, um, about and basically about 5.7% of the population having completed two doses and 13.5% of Hawaii County um, have received at least one dose. So the big island has been doing very well as far as getting vaccinated. So hopefully we can get into herd immunity soon. Statewide, 14.4, so we're at least one dose. Um, so we are getting there. Okay, next slide. So if you are if you are 75 or older, you can go hit Bait Clinic to register. CVS Longs has a different line of vaccine. Again, this is basically only for Kupuna though. Other uh, frontline and 1B workers need to go and um, register with Bait Clinic or with um, uh, the, excuse me. Um, Department of Health. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay, so here's Hawaii District Health Department of Health office for other essential workers like teachers. If um, again, grocery store workers, other essential workers that haven't been vaccinated yet, it goes to DOH. Hilo Medical Center and CVS are only doing Kapuna, 75 and older. Same with Kona Community Hospital and Queens North Hawaii Community Hospital. Okay, next slide. Okay, Johnson & Johnson is shipping out. So hopefully we can expedite um, the vaccinations of 65 and older sooner than end of March. Okay, next slide. So the we're down to 10 day quarantine, but you still need to quarantine even though you're vaccinated, okay, for inter-island and it's 10 days, um, I quarantine or, I, or you can get tested um, whenever I come to the Capitol and I return back home. So um, everyone else needs to do that too, or I get tested. 
Um, next slide. Okay, so Pahoa Puna Library Update. You folks have seen me in the front page. And basically, I just wanna make sure you folks know that there are two libraries being planned, one for Upper Puna and one for Lower Puna. Lower Puna is being put together first. An environmental assessment has come out. Uh, site one is by the Pahoa Fire Station, DMV. That's because infrastructure is already there. Same thing with Pahoa District Park and site two. Site three is um, Highway one, Malkoff Highway 130 towards um, intersection of Naiulani and Highway 130. These are all state lands. We're not buying new lands. And we are looking at places that have infrastructure already in place because as people know who use libraries, broadband and facilities are gonna be in great demand. Okay, KL library sites are being proposed now for environmental assessment and that is the next one coming up online. Next slide. Okay, I've also been on the front page on being up there with keeping up, keeping up to date with broadband issues, especially for Puna. So Department of Hawaiian Homelands, Maku'u, Hawaiian Tail is finally expanding and providing fiber internet there. Um, it's about time and that just only started recently. So if you're in Maku'u, um, you can finally get on internet. Okay, Starlink, uh, that is um, Elon Musk has been sending out satellites into space and that's a possibility. In fact, if you go into Starlink website, they are actually registering people in Puna, but that won't be, that won't likely occur until 2022 or later. And the big, the big, big news is a $50 credit towards a broadband bill per a current um, recently enacted federal act that just occurred this week, February 25th. Okay, for eligible households, it's $50 per month and up to $75 a month on tribal lands, which is the people who live on Hawaiian homelands. And also provides a one-time discount of up to $100 on a computer or tablet for eligible households. In fact, Bert Lum, who um, was my speaker last year and is our broadband guru in the state, has estimated that for a four month period for 200 um, or so households, this could, be, this could be a potential $40 million benefit to the state of Hawaii. Okay, so um, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so go into www.fcc.gov slash broadband benefit. Okay, they're gonna roll out this emergency broadband benefit on the second half of April of this year. And so for eligible households, this could, like I said, this could be potentially um, for four months, if 200,000 people apply, that's $40 million to the state of Hawaii, okay? Um, that's over and beyond for unemployment benefits, any other benefits. So next slide. Okay, next slide. Starlink, as I said, is co coming up. Spectrum intends to expand, but hasn't given us proof. Um, any updates as to where in Puna they intend to expand. Uh, cell phone carriers, of course, you folks are hearing about them um, in putting up more cell phone towers up. And next slide, please. Hawaiian Tel was just awarded $24 million for Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Hawaiian Tel is really expanding in the Puna area. And uh, they still, it, even in addition to that federal act, you can possibly um, be able to qualify for this internet COCOA program. And that's www.hawaiantel.com slash residential 
slash discounted dash services for qualified Hawaiian Hawaii residents. Okay. In 2021, they expect they intend to expand further into Mountain View. I think they did almost all of Hawaiian Acres last year, and um, if not, and hopefully this year, um, more areas in Keao and about 175 areas in um, in Nalehu. So there's going to be a lot more fiber and hopefully broadband everywhere. Um, next slide. Do folks know that I am in the forefront of Pohiki boat ramp issues? And that's also made the front page. Okay, we are moving towards um, three possibilities. Uh, there's a dredging project of $1.5 million that has been appropriated and that qualifies for an environmental assessment projection exemption. Um, next slide. Next. Okay, thank you. Okay, and that, that's the first column, that's the dredging. Uh, we have 1.5 million, it may cost another million dollars to um, prevent the sand from moving back in. Uh, the second potential is for en entrance channel improvements, uh, create a swimming area and basically um, make more permanent the excavation and dredging idea. And the third possibility is a whole new boat ramp. And that would be $28 million. And that would have a construction timeline of five to six years. Um, but right now, uh, most fishermen just want to get into the water so that they can start providing for their families. And hopefully, uh, Board of Land and Natural Resources see that it's EA exempted. Okay, so legislative website. Okay, like I told you last year, I mean, er, earlier, we are on a shortened legislative session this year. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, submitting testimony. Um, anyway, some of you may be, may be asked by me to submit testimony. You need to go into the legislative website and to be able to submit testimony within 48 hours of a hearing. That is basically how you're able to submit testimony, especially during this virtual session. It actually allows for equality for those of us who live in the neighbor islands. Before Hawaii and um, Oahu people can just come in on the last minute and have their say, now they have to register just like the rest of us and, um, and written testimony, which is how you do it from the neighbor islands and how the slide shows you how to do it, actually um, has more of a say than, um, more, more so now than ever because everything is virtual and the state capital is closed. Next slide. So when I ask you to be, provide testimony, um, next slide, how a bill becomes law. Okay, generally both the House and Senate introduce bills and we'll tell you how many bills goes in. They go into different tracks, parallel tracks. It goes to committee hearings and the yellow and then goes to second and third meeting. And right now, right at this very moment, there's the crossover. Um, some of you have seen, may have seen my personal um, Facebook snide remark on those people who are asking us to pass Senate bills. All the Senate bills have already been heard this session, okay? So we're in the crossover. So we're crossing over the Senate bills over to the House. The House bills now crosses over to the Senate, and we'll see whether or not there's an agreement. Okay, we can then make agreements on the second crossover thing. There's conference, and then when we finally have an agreement, it then goes to the governor um, where he can decide whether or not to agree on what the House and the Senate come up with or whether not to veto it. And if he does veto it, whether then it goes back up to us to see whether or not we decide to override it. Next slide. Okay, and the reason I'm, I am circling that it's because um, one of my 
front page bills, I think last year or last year was um, civil asset forfeiture, which the governor vetoed. And it's, I think it's one of my claims to fame that I probably have some of the most bills that are, has been vetoed by the governor. <laughs> okay. I mean, after going to the phalanx of going, of getting the senators to agree to my bill and getting the house members to agree to my bill, just to have it to go to the governor and having the governor say no, but it, it is what it is. And uh, then we move, we, then we start all over. Next slide. So um, if you look at 2019, 2017, there were 2,918 bills um, that was introduced, but eventually passed less than 10%. 2020, okay, 2,336, and even less than, I don't know, it looks like only 3% of the bills became law. And that's because COVID-19, and those were mostly, if you folks remember, those were mostly coronavirus relief bills, you know, how to handle the mask, the CARES funding, and how, to, how do we fund um, unemployment when the unemployment fund has been depleted? Those were the kind of bills we're looking at. Okay, next slide. So 2021, I believe we have like, less than 2,000 bills that we're going through. Remember, I'm chair of human services. So what kind of bills are we looking at um, that affect us? I mean, there's a lot of bills, like, I, like you saw. There's about a couple hundred bills that go back and forth. But these are the ones that I am focusing on in this town hall. Take protection, child abuse bills, one of my bills that basically um, gives immunity to people who provide information or assistance in child abuse cases. Um, this has failed before for various reasons and hopefully will pass at this time. Uh, next slide. Okay, so persons with disabilities, minimum wage. Now, there's a lot of focus on a living wage, but most people don't, don't know that disabled or handicapped actually got paid less than minimum wage. This will highly, um, we passed this in human services committee where we basically eliminated um, this subminimum wage because just because you're disabled doesn't mean you are entitled to less monies. Um, and especially with, um, with various other credits given to the employers to incentivize hiring of the disabled. So uh, I have a lot of confidence that this will pass this year. Okay, next slide. Okay, there's also um, another homelessness bill and um, in my committee, which also includes homelessness. Basically this requires the, um, or allows the governor's coordinator in homelessness, that's Scott Morshigan, to work with the various counties to basically effect um, a county per county plan. Okay, next slide. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later on. Sex trafficking for minors in, um, basically includes coercion as a means of committing the offense of sex. We're, we are changing the, in the past five years, the legislator has moved to um, change the viewpoint of prostitution as being a crime, instead focusing on sex trafficking and the Johns who are preying on the prostitutes as sex trafficking victims. So you'll hear more about sex trafficking rather than prostitution because um, we're, we're looking at it as a, to, to focus really on, on what is the violence that is being caused to usually minors and women. And that's usually because of the sex traffic curse more so than the victims who are being entrapped into, this, um, into prostitution. So coercion, designating solicitation of minor as a form of sex trafficking. And, um, and there's a, gonna be a possibility of removing the statute of limitations for sex trafficking, especially when it comes to minors. 
okay, that's moving along, but um, there's still some work that needs to be done on the wording of that date. Next slide. Okay, um, this allows the Department of Human Services to administer public assistance to eligible residents during, during now. So it gives basically um, a little bit more power and flexibility to the Department of Human Services, which has stepped up to the plate to um, come up with benefits at a time when we need it the most. Next slide. Okay, I, again, I'm in also consumer protection and health. So next slide. So food donations. We want to make it easier for people to donate food and not be charged with um, and 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 not risk being sued. So um, they have basically shown that when and you folks know this when you folks buy Love's Bakery bread that has already been expired from the shelves um, where their freshness. They have found that basically manufacturers have used them the expiration date, not because of food safety, but because it's a way of churning the product to make the consumer go away what could be perfectly good food, but basically buy something else. So, so long as it's edible and so long as, as it is not spoiled, um, we want to we want to be able to expand food donations, especially at a time when people are food insecure. Okay, so that is what um, this bill goes towards. Next slide. Okay, we also want to authorize more ag co-ops and um, and consumer co-ops to co so that basically. They can sell to members and non-members alike, and hopefully we can help, again, people help themselves from being food insecure, from being food secure. Next slide. Okay, so we're also going to allow for an expansion of shade houses um, with, to exempt them from building permits that hopefully, again, uh, and we're going to limit it to space to basically, we want to increase food sustainability. And this is one way uh, we believe we could do it by cutting construction costs. Next slide. Okay, food labeling. Okay, we want to, um, this is really a consumer protection issue. There are basically a lot of uh, food products that claim to be GMO free or non-GMO or organic and are in actually fraudulent. And this basically prevents food manufacturers from making less than factual health claims on their labels. Next slide. Okay, because we don't have as many um, med medical health care workers, we want to expand community health care workers, and this is really needed like in areas in Kau, where Auntie Jesse has, has a pilot program there, and hopefully we could increase um, community health care workers that go to the Kapuna household, and they actually um, go there with iPads, assuming that there is broadband, and they actually, you know, get their, their health stats, make sure that they're okay. And um, hopefully that kind of face-to-face -face is needed, especially in rural, high Kupuna-based um, communities. And we hope to expand that. Next, next slide. Okay, because of COVID-19, um, we are looking at com commercial rent relief for local businesses and hopefully establish a commercial to actually pay some rent instead of preventing just eviction so that the landlords themselves would be able to make their mortgage payments. Um, we, and we hope to be able to get some fabric, some matching federal funds for that. Next slide. Okay, these are some of my own personal bills. Next slide. 
um, medical cannabis. Everybody who has voted for me the past three, so, um, three to four terms know I have been a proponent of legalization or decriminalization. So basically, um, it has been really odd that we allow people to grow marijuana, but don't give them an opportunity to buy the seeds to grow marijuana. So this bill hopefully allows them to buy the, um, you know, the clones so that they know that the marijuana that they're growing is, is safe and, and, and legal. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'm gonna try civil asset forfeiture relief again. And basically, um, next slide. Basically, what I did was in 2017, whenever, because um, I know Josh Green tried to, when he was a senator, tried to do a civil asset forfeiture relief himself. So what I did was basically, I, and the legislature agreed with me, we did an audit to see whether or not the attorney general, uh, I asked for an audit, which the attorney general kept saying that it's basically a law enforcement tool. So what has the audit shown? The audit show, shows that about 27%, you see a 26%, no charge at all. They acquired assets of 26% of people that they did not charge at all. Over 63%, um, only 63% have been convicted. So you're looking at about 39% or so where at, of people whose assets were taken and who were not convicted of a crime. And not only that, they couldn't account for what they did with the monies, okay? They were supposed to put $2 million of it to drug prevention programs. None of it went there. They had no rules until recently. So, um, $11.5 million worth of civil asset forfeiture was acquired. And again, 26% of those, um, no charges at all, 4% was dismissed. And for various reasons, um, were not, were, there were no convictions. So th there needs to be some relief, especially since um, what, the, um, what the audit has shown was they targeted mostly uh, the poor who couldn't afford their own lawyer because there are no lawyers when they when they do civil asset forfeiture. Um, next slide. No free lawyers. Okay, so um, we've also I've also I'm pushing to require landlords who are seeking to evict to provide a general excise tax to show that basically they're legal because one of the things that we have seen when, when we did the rental relief, a lot of the landlords were not even paying general excise tax. So they're asking the courts to evict, yet do not pay, are, not, are they themselves not taxpayers? Okay, next slide. Um, so I also did a, cap, a capital improvement project request um, Highway 130, the shower drive right turn lane got removed. So um, I'm making a request that the right turn on red for shower be reinstated so that we don't have the potential. Those people who go from Pohaku to Highway 130 and from shower to Highway 130 you know that there's almost always a near collision right there at green when you're about to make a right turn. When it used to be, very smooth. So um, 1.3 million, I'm asking for that. Uh, those who know who have run into the National Youth Challenge Academy, um, these are young boys and girls who have had trouble with the law and have, have found a way to contribute to our community. They're the ones who help us out at the Pahoa parades, the volcano parades, and you know they do a lot of like rubbish cleanup and maintenance, and they, um, for some reason, powers that be intend to close the Hilo campus. I want, um, I'm asking for six hundred thousand to support uh, the Hilo campus from remaining with a seventy five percent federal matching grants. Um, Kau High and Pahawa Elementary to um, construct a seven 
classroom building. This assumes that we've got money. I don't know whether or not we do, but um, in the event that there, we have some infrastructure money, uh, Ka'u High and Pahala Elementary really need to have a classroom building. Okay, next slide. Okay, and others, KL High School covering up their play court. Tionopoko needs a new playground. Pahoa Elementary still needs their cafeteria, but we are still awaiting for the, um, the master plan. And Pahoa High, of course, needs a new administration building. Next slide. So these are my requests. Um, oh. It's out of order. So um, I'm also asking because our big island dispensaries are doing really quite well um, compare and are cheaper apparently than other um, dispensaries. They wanna be able to transport and not only qualifying patients be able to transport, but they want to also be able to um, sell, have patients fly in to Kilo and some have to be able to get um, personal quantities to be able to fly back to their island. So hopefully, um, especially if you are a medical marijuana uh, patient, you should be able to, or at least personal quantities, be able to get on a plane and go to Oahu or for medical services or whatever you need to. Next slide. Okay, squatters are always a problem. That's what happened to Akibona. I'm asking the counties to expedite any um, demolition permits for vacant or abandoned residential homes. Um, next slide, because I don't want to what happened to Akibona to happen again. Um, KK Caucus, oh, um, I'm pushing for an emancipation um, possibility uh, right now. If you are 16 or 17 year old or in an abusive household that basically is somehow not covered by CPS, because frankly, you know, because of the high caseload and lack of manpower, they do, CPS do, does focus on the younger children. Um, this bill would allow you to seek emancipation if you're self-supporting. Right now, there is no other means for emancipation for you unless you get married. So uh, this bill will allow you to emancipate. Okay, next slide. Okay, cultivation licenses. Um, I want, right now, there's only eight dispensaries. That means only eight entities are able to make money out of our medical marijuana dispensary law. So basically I want to be, create a cultivation facility license so that growers would be able to also, uh, you know, make some money by selling to existing dispensaries. And hopefully um, the marijuana economic growth that we sort of envision, envisioned when we first started the medical marijuana dispensary license program um, what, six years ago could finally expand and we could actually get some profits out of it and some taxes out of it, especially at a time like right now when we have a huge economic downturn. So this is one way of um, hopefully that the governor will not veto um, like he has vetoed my prior transportation and um, civil asset forfeiture bills. Okay, next slide. Okay, I also want, okay, because people are losing their jobs and are unable to pay their creditors, I am also, have also introduced a bill to at least um, have a moratorium on wage garnishment so that whatever few monies, um, part-time work that people are able to get, that those are not going to be garnished um, by the creditor and allow people to live Next slide. Okay, other priorities. Next slide. Um, again, Youth Challenge Academy. I, I think that it's really important to have our troubled youth who are trying to make a difference be allowed to do so by having the Hilo campus continue. Next slide. Unemployment benefits. 
Um, here are the toll-free numbers. Those of you who are having problems know that you can always call my office and we will do our best to follow up. Because of privacy laws, we cannot advocate for you, but we can help you follow up with, um, with your claims. So in the meantime, uh, these are the call centers you can call. And of course, you can always call our office. Next slide. Um, so the state Senate passed a modest minimum wage increase. Hopefully, um, you know, like the, the like the federal government has tried, federal, the federal Democrats have tried to do by having a federal minimum wage increase. The whole idea is by raising, you know, the minimum amount of of wages. Uh, because a lot of people are going to end up getting like part-time work, that we could have at least some monies <coughs> available to be freely spent in the economy and increase the economy that way. Again, with this minimal amount of minimum wage increase, we hope that um, it doesn't deter businesses from hiring future employees. Um, next slide. Okay, homelessness summit. Um, homelessness was one of my big projects back when I was a state rep and Ohana Zones bill that I passed in 2017. What has it led to? Basically, it has created navigation centers. Um, we have rise units, correctional centers. And also, there's also the um, over the Hale Hanak Ike and other funding, also like in Kona, that's, that's occurring. Uh, next slide, and point in time homeless counts have shown that whereas it has increased from 2009 to 2016, it has actually started to decrease until the pandemic hit around by 18%, yeah? Um, my homelessness summit is, has shown that it is expected like the 2008 economic downturn that homelessness will probably increase by 30% in the next two years. But right now, even though you see a lot more than the street, and that's because COVID has prevented us from doing congre congregational type settings. That's why you see them more on the streets. Uh, the actual homelessness counts has actually decreased by about 20% on the big island. Okay, next slide. Okay. So impact of family homelessness on the big island, 33% um, of children, 58% are of single mothers, 45% of our children under the age of five. So next slide. So it's usually younger children, yeah? Even the ones you see on the street are the ones who are unable to be sheltered. Okay. Um, hopefully, we're going to have a pandemic economic recovery program. The one point, um, despite the $1.7 trillion um, package that you can see Senator Schatz's photo, um, the governor has expected over a $1 billion, $1.4 billion deficit in the coming year. And that's why I sent out a survey asking you folks your ideas about um, economic um, relief, okay? Next slide. So what has the survey shown? Okay, survey, legalizing hemp um, was one idea I came up with, 631, this is about preliminary, okay? We've had a lot of people respond. We've had over almost a thousand people responded, which is, over twice the amount of people who have responded to any of my prior surveys. So we've only counted about half of them so far. And of those um, who have responded, um, 631 have said yes, 605 or legalized marijuana have said yes. So substantial amount, over 60% and for to legalize them, about over 70% about legalizing marijuana as a way of reviving the economy. You know, I did have a comment saying, why am I asking about ways to revive the economy? I mean, these are quick fixes, but um, I don't think the person who wrote that 
understood the level of economic depression we are facing um, or will be facing soon. And that's why we do need this out of the box. It's not really out of the box because other states have already legalized it and have done well with it. Um, so it's about time Hawaii does, okay? Uh, especially since we were the first state to actually legalize medical marijuana, but we haven't capitalized on it. Next slide. Okay, legalize sports betting. I mean, people already bets on sports, so why don't why shouldn't we tax it? About sixty one percent of the people um, have said that legalizing sports betting is a good idea. Sixty one percent said legalizing gambling. And again, the Hawaiian Homelands Bill had come out, and a lot of homesteaders, um, Hawaiian Homelands, did not like to have it. But it's one of those things that uh, the discussion needs to take place. Because let's face it, I'll, a lot of us go to the Ninth Island. Um, people already know, especially when Super Bowl comes around, that people already do uh, do some sports betting. The question is whether or not we should be able to tax it and be able to regulate it so that um, as a way of reviving the economy. Okay, next slide. And over 60% of you folks agree. Okay, so um, of those percentages, okay, legalizing marijuana is big, legalizing hemp. If you combine those two, you're over 69% are saying legalize both of them. Only 16% says legalizing gaming um, as a way of doing it and, uh, and legalizing sports betting. You're still talking about significant 30% looking at um, legalizing some form of gaming. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, we will answer all your questions. Survey results, private roads. Uh, we have miles of private roads, you, know, you folks know this. Okay, it's surprising, it's su surprising to me that only, that 46% are very happy with the roads in their subdivision, okay? But again, this is only 50%. I expected it to be uh, substantially less than that. But 54% are, are unhappy with the roads and how the association are man managing the roads. And those who have complained are mostly from HPP, Nana Valley, and Orchid Land. Those are the three big ones. I expected some from Fern Forest, um, but I, 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 um, I didn't hear much about that. And I expected some also from Hawaiian Acres, but I didn't hear that many. But then again, I, we've only looked at 50%. Okay, again, most of the people complained were um, from Lower Puna. Next slide. What do you think is the most important issue facing our economy now? I mean, our community now? Econ Economy and jobs and COVID-19 looks like it. 24% economy jobs, crime, drugs, of course. Whenever there's a downturn in the economy, crime goes up, especially property crime. So um, to me, they're very related. And of course, COVID-19, uh, screwing our economy, it, it is up there. Um, climate change is a low percentage. I think that's because it's a back burner issue now because of COVID-19. I'm sure as soon as COVID-19 is taken care of, climate change is gonna increase um, roads and infrastructure because we still all need to be able to get to where we need to go. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, we've talked about this. There are other issues. People complain about fireworks, especially after um, whenever there's firework sales and uh, support for ag and STEM, diversifying local economy, traffic, mental health care, but um, those are side issues compared to the rest. And we've talked about broadband, internet connectivity, and food security. Okay, next slide. Okay, I just want to talk about traffic because like that was brought up before. Uh, there are going to be single lane closures on both sides starting March 1st on right, Route 130 between 11 and 14, the Pahoa Bypass Road. 
and wherever new new road is um, for more traffic updates go to hi dot next slide um, and if you have any more contact information contact me so i know there are questions in the chat um jacob hi senator oh, Oh, sorry, one more thing. I guess we have one more last slide. Because I know that Ashley Kirkwood's our um, county councilwoman had signed up. I don't know if she's one of the actual participants now. But, you know, I really want to do a shout out to her because the Pohiki boat ramp and all the work she, she as well as her team has done in the Kilauea recovery plan. Please look that up because, you know, Puna has been hit by Hurricane Isel. The Kilauea lava flow, and you know, 2014 there was there was that um, almost that flow that that crossed Highway 130. So we've had multiple disasters in just the past six years, and not counting the pandemic. Okay, in addition to the pandemic, so um, please look at the Kilauea recovery plan and see whether or not you, there's any more input you can go there. Okay, so I think next slide is questions and answers. Yeah. Okay, Jacob. Thank you, Senator. Um, before we get to the audience questions, uh, for those of you who are here in the uh, Zoom chat, uh, we did get one question that was emailed to the Senator. Um, Senator, and that question was, can you address whether there has been any forward movement on the matter of alternate routes in and out of Kuna? Okay, so for those of you who have followed my career, that was my prime um, getting an alternate route, specifically the Puna Makai access route, was my primary goal when I first got elected back in 2014. And I actually got money in around 19 million, but the stars were not aligned. I couldn't get the county to agree with me on that. And, um, and then so the, that money lapsed. And the county did not agree with me because there were people in HPP, there were people in Kana Eva who does not agree with it. Um, now there is, we are looking at a $1.4 billion deficit. It's highly unlikely it's gonna move forward in the near future. And again, even if um, we have the money, the stars need to be aligned. For lack of better term means county needs to be agreeable with it and the county won't be in agreeable with it until the community is in agreement with it and that means hpp and the pana eva um households are agreeing with it okay but thank you senator it's always in my radar thank you senator um and we can uh we're going to move now to the question and um answer segment uh if you do have a question for the senator um please raise your virtual hand um but i believe there's some in the chat yeah, so let's, okay, so let's go through um, some of them in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, Senator, one of the questions uh, is, what is the process and cost of hauling off unwanted vehicles in Leilani and other subdivisions? Okay, so I don't know the costs. Um, you really, if if Councilwoman Ashley Kirkowitz is, is, is on the line, you, you really need to talk to her because so far, all the count, the county, and I really need to give kudos to them, have been paying for a number of these hauling of these cars. The big one that happened recently was Hawaiian Homelands, and they used Hawaiian Homelands monies to haul off all those cars off of Maku'u. Um, I think when we actually, prior to that, before we even, because my, my husband, does kind of some salvage work once in a while. Um, it was because there was a, we, we didn't have as much junk car problem when there was a high salvage value for these used cars. In fact, if you folks remember the signs on the streets asking to buy used cars. And hopefully, I, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that we get to that point again where the cost of the hauling is at least equivalent to the cost of the resale value of the salvage cars. But until we get to that point, we're still gonna get a bunch of junk cars and um, we're gonna end up having to get some funds to haul those cars away. There is a, another question, uh, Senator, um, about lotteries. Uh, the, the comment is, what about 
lotteries, we don't have to gamble. Um, okay. Give yourself that. So so lotteries are a good idea. In fact, there are a couple of bills out there um, asking for lotteries for at least the education fund. But the reality is, okay, anybody who has ever bought a lottery ticket or is expecting to get like a million dollars or let's go be part of the mega lottery bill thing, the state of Hawaii population base, and that includes the elderly and the children is 1.4 million, okay? And if you're looking at a lottery of a million dollars, that requires each and every every kid to buy a one dollar lottery ticket, or assuming twenty five percent of the population, you gotta expect at least two hundred fifty thousand of those people to buy at least what, five dollars worth just to come up with the lottery prize. Uh, we can. I don't see it as a viable. Um, to the extent that it's viable in major cities and in major states, okay? Unless you're expecting like a $50,000 lottery ticket with a $5 buy-in, then you can probably raise some monies. But those, uh, you know, I don't know whether or not there's an appetite that much for a $50,000 lottery. I may be wrong. There's a bill out there. We could try it. Um, there is a, another question uh, in the chat, Senator. Uh, talk, uh, is there still talk about a road usage tax? Uh, yes. And um, the, the idea is to go away from gas tax and move towards a road usage. And I think last year you folks had those um, surveys. And if you had filled in the survey, they're going to be able to try to estimate for you how much you are paying in gas taxes versus how much you would be paying in road usage. And they, they say that because a lot of poor people usually have the inefficient gas burning vehicles that the road usage tax is actually cheaper for a poor person than a gas tax. But we'll see, that's what the study is supposed to show. Uh, the next question is, um, how do you think the 2020 decennial uh, census count will affect the redistricting and representation of the Puna area with the loss of residents um, that lost their houses in the Leilani area during the 2018 Kilauea eruption? So we're not gonna know the census until I think April. Okay, what's well, supposed to be end of December. We're not gonna know until April. And you know what they have found is that the people from Leilani, um, a, well, a lot of them, some of them I know actually moved to like Waimea and outside of Leilani, but a lot of the people in the affected areas actually moved to other parts of Pune, like Paradise Park, Mountain View, but they stay in the Puna area. So Puna itself, I don't think is gonna be affected by redistricting, but we'll see. I, I don't know until we actually see um, the census in April. Thank you. Uh, we do have more uh, questions from the chat, but let's move to uh, um, people who raise their hand. So uh, Judith, I see that you have your hand raised um, if you wanted to ask your question to the Senator. Hi. Oh, uh, Judith, are you there? Uh, which is bad because nothing, it's just been negative. Sorry, Judith, I don't see that you have your there mic. Okay, we may, maybe we'll come back to Judith. Um, oh, hi. Dana, I see uh, Dana or Dana, do you have your hand raised? Yes, I do. I had a question for Joy. Yep, the floor is yours. Joy, Joy do, you, do you know that PGV Pune Geothermal Ventures lease will be up soon and that there have been different organizations who have asked for a new EIS to be 
done for PGV? What are your viewpoints on that? And are you going to push PGV to get a new um, EIS because of the way the land has changed there? And it's been like 1980s when they got the first EIS. And there are a lot of us that would like to see that happen. And we just want to know what your take is and how you will support us in pushing PGV to get a new EIS. Thank you. Okay, okay. so um, I don't know. I, I did not know that their lease was up. I thought they owned the land. Okay, I, I guess. Um, no, you know, they're leaving. Okay, it. so I, I, okay, so you know what? We need to talk more offline about that. Okay, um, I, I don't want to. You know, I, I've, I've been to the PG to some PGV, um, uh, uh, community meetings, and that wasn't brought up in the ones I've attended, and so, um. Yeah, you could no, talk no. to I, Robert I, 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 who is oh, yeah. a Punapono Alliance. He'll, he's very informed. Okay, and he I know Bob. Let, you know, I, yeah. I know Bob Petrucci. Okay, I'll talk awesome. more to him Thank about you. it. It's a big concern for us. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so I just want to be respectful of um, everyone's time. Uh, it is six o three p.m. Um, we'll take about two more questions from the chat. Um, but if you do have further questions for the Senator, uh, we'll make sure that her contact information uh, um, is in the chat um, and we'll that uh, we reach out to you after the meeting. Um, but the, one of the last questions um, is from Melvin. Um, what is your plan to boosting Hawaii's economy with the private sector? Okay, so that, that's a big plan. That's a big ask, okay? That's the reason I asked for the... Um, what your folks' thoughts are, because my plan was actually if we could get the governor to legalize hemp and marijuana, because that has done very well in Colorado. And that's why I submitted all these bills, like allowing for inter-island transport, which he had vetoed, allowing for cultivation licenses. So it, you need to get, it cannot be my plan. It has to be the governor's plan because no matter what I push, even if I could get the Senate to agree, and a lot of senators have agreed with me because they have they have introduced, like Kalani English has introduced a lot of legalizing um, marijuana and hemp bills. Um, if the governor is intent on vetoing it and it's not part of his plan, it's not gonna go anywhere. Yeah, Thank you, that's Senator. where we are. Thank you, Senator. And yeah, so um, we just wanted to take the time to uh, thank you folks for coming on uh, to Senator's town hall. Uh, this isn't gonna be the last one. Um, Senator does plan to have a town hall event towards the end of session uh, to provide a um, update on what's going on uh, in the latter part of the legislative session. Um, but if you folks do have further questions, uh, please, feel, please feel free to uh, reach out to um, Senator and her staff um, Senator's email, and I'll make sure it, it is in this chat, but it's a sen, san buenaventura at capital.hawaii.gov. And her office phone number is 586-6890. Um, so if you folks do have further questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to Senator's staff um, and uh, they will be working hard to get back to you. Um, and I'll leave the floor to Senator for some closing remarks. You know, I, I really want to thank you, Jacob. I want, I really want to appreciate everyone who participated in this virtual town hall with me. I apologize that I spent too much time talking about um, what's happening rather than asking for you folks' questions. But I am, I do my best, at least my staff does its best to respond to each and every one of you folks. So if you could email us, um, you know, or call us, emailing, do both. We will do our best to respond to you, okay? Thank you, Mahalo. Senator. And for those of you, um, th this uh, meeting um, will be posted to our Hawaii uh, Senate YouTube page by tomorrow, um, but it's also being streamed live on our Hawaii State Senate Facebook. Uh, so as soon as this meeting is over, uh, that recording will be made available on Facebook. 
Um, and hope you all have a great rest of your evening and we'll see you folks at the next one. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.